So um, this is the second talk of many probably about functional programming in Emacs Lisp. And I will be covering some, whoops, whoops that's not quite what I intended. Um, so I will be covering some uh, stuff in Common Lisp as well, because partly because Common Lisp can do things that Emacs Lisp can't, and partly because the knowledge of Common Lisp helps you become better Emacs Lisp programmers. So the CL package, for example, will have a lot of Common Lisp stuff in it. So you need to have some knowledge of Common Lisp to make the most use of that. So anywhere that I've put examples, they're all Emacs Lisp unless stated otherwise. And uh, so this is the rough outline of the talk. Uh, this section is what I call the basics section, which is not necessarily basic, but, but uh, sort of before we get into the advanced topics. So they're about functional programming, they're about mapping, and hopefully we get to the using lists as well at some point during the talk. There will also be uh, things for you to ponder. Meditations are the things you, I want you to think about. Sort of, sometimes I'll give the answer, sometimes not. And there will be exercises as well. And generally, if there are exercises, I will give the answer to the exercises as well. So just to give a very brief summary of talk one, in case you've forgotten, because it was about a month ago, the, the basic principles of functional programming are that variables are immutable. The functions usually do not have side effects and you can sort of divide and conquer to approach the problem. We'll see an example in a moment. So where we do permit functions to have side effects is either when they do have side effects, which we'll get to later in the talk, probably not today, or when you are acting on a value that can't be seen as by anybody else. So you have something that acts on a list that is just a temporary list. And in that case, of course, it's fine to have side effects because nobody else can see that list. So it may actually be more efficient for you to have an action on the list that destroys the list or something rather than creating a new list. So we shall talk about that as well during this talk or the next one or both. So here's an example of what we got to in talk one. Suppose we want to calculate the factorial of a number, uh, then we can do that using a function and a helper function. So the main function takes a parameter k and then it calculates, uh, well, it's got a documentation string and then it checks that the input is actually of the right flavor. Once we know that the input is the right flavor, then we can pass it to the actual helper function, which does the actual work of calculating the factorial. And you can see that it does it in a functional style by saying the factorial of zero is one and the factorial of everything else is k times whatever factorial of one minus k is. So it's using the mathematical in, in, induction to calculate the, the, the value expressed in Lisp. And the nice thing about this is that all the error checking is done in the top function, the, the wrapper function, if you like, the parent function. So we can optimize as much as we like the, the helper function. We can just optimize it like crazy because we know that by the time the control flow reaches that helper function, it is seeing an integer. We don't have to check this anymore. So we can actually, in fact, Lisp will still check it because Lisp doesn't know that this is a helper function, but we can optimize it a lot in principle. So, so first today we will talk about mapping. Uh, so one thing I want you to think about is why does this not work? Why can I not apply and as a function? So um, if I take the parameters nil t and t and pass to and, that gives me a Boolean result, but I can't use apply to do that. It actually will not work in Emacs, and I want you to think about why. This one actually interestingly works in Emacs Lisp. So I can actually say call, call the function if uh, taking t yes and no, and it will return yes. Whereas in common Lisp, it would not work. So that's the thing to think about. And as I say, I will give you examples um, and answers to all the exercises and stuff, but probably in the next talk, so you have time to think about it. And I will also publish the slides, so don't worry about writing things down. Okay, so now we're moving onward. Um, I want to look at an example of sorting months. So I, I was using a piece of software sometime last year that sorted months alphabetically. So in that case, August comes before July and April comes before January, and it's a real pain to deal with, of course. 
So we want to not do that because we are better than that. So I've just defined a test list called dates where I put in some dates. So the 10th of August, the 2nd of December, the 17th of March and so on. And we want to sort them by month number. So one way to do that is to actually calculate the month number by looking up the month in a string and finding out what the index is of, of that. That is what search does. And then we divide by three and add one and we get the month number. So um, that's perfectly fine. You may want to think about how we can make this month number better, but, but um, it, it'll do for now. Whoops. So what I now do is use Mapcar to create the month number and add it to the data that I've got. So it creates a new list from my test list and it adds the month number in front. So the 10th of August turns into 8, 10 August which means eight month, 10th date, August, 12th month, second date, December, and so on. And now I can sort them by passing them to the sort function. So here's the thing I got before. This is exactly the one as, as I have on the top of the page. And the sort function says um, sort by the first entry. And if the first entries are the same, then sort by the second entry. The first entry now is the month and the second entry is the date. So it gives me exactly what I want to do. And then at the end, I use Mapcar again to, to take the month away because I just wanted the dates. So all we do is to remove the month number from the result. And as you can see, it has worked perfectly well. I now get the 4th of January, which was the first one, which you couldn't see before because it had scrolled off the page. But you know, next one is 17th of March, 30th of April, August comes over here and so on. And it has, has actually worked really well. So this is an example where we use mapping to sort of generate extra data, sorting on it, and then stripping it away again. Of course, in Lisp, we don't actually have to do that because we can do much better. I can just pass the whole sort function into to the, the sort call. So I just say, uh, calculate the month numbers, then compare the month numbers if they're if one is less or if they're equal and the dates are less, then, then sort them. And that works as well. So that's much easier to do. So um, you might ponder why I could just use sort directly here and why in the next page I need CopySec for this to work. In common list, we can do even better because there's a key parameter to the sort function which unfortunately Emacs doesn't have, but it means that I can actually use the, the key function normally extracts the field in the record that I want to sort on, but I can actually use it to, or abuse it if you like, to calculate the actual day number, uh, which um, I do here by just multiplying 40 by the month number. All I need is an incrementing sequence. So it doesn't matter that there are not 40 months, 40 days in each month. I just need it to be an incrementing sequence so that the 1st of April comes after the 31st of March. So uh, this works even better. I can just, um, I don't need any of this, this stuff. So you can see you can actually express things very concisely in common Lisp if you think about it carefully. The key function is designed, as I said, to extract a field but I can abuse that a little bit to uh, sort of creatively, shall we say, to, to actually calculate the day number or an, an increasing sequence of, of numbers for the, each of the days. Here's another piece of interesting stuff I, I dug out of my um, advent of code from last year. So this is a piece of magic, which unfortunately I think works only in common Lisp because um, it shows you that I want to use the apply function to call Mapcar. But apply in common Lisp allows me to pass in a parameter to Mapcar, which in this case becomes the first element that Mapcar sees in its, in its arguments. And then the rows in this case would be a list of lists that apply then applies to. So each one of those lists in rows will then appear as arguments to Mapcar after the list function. So the upshot of all that is that the, this transpose function will take a list of lists and transpose it. So it takes the first elements and creates a list out of those. It takes the second element and creates a list out of those and the third elements and creates a list out of those. 
And it just shows you, um, we will return to this example later uh, in the advanced topic sections, one of them, but it shows you the kind of magic you can do sometimes with, with Lisp because apply takes, it lets us pass in an extra argument that is not, that is effectively bound as the first parameter to map car, then um, I can suddenly do something very complicated in a single line. So that I thought that was just beautiful. There's a lot of space for beauty, beautiful code in Lisp. Here's another example that I wanted to go through. Um, so there was one of the examples from the advent of code that wanted us to look at a list of integers and find where a, an integer was lower than the one before and lower than the one after. So if you have uh, three, one, two, for example, you should pick out the one and say, and return the index of that. So um, this was one of the things where I didn't think about it too much. I just put in something that, that worked. So I extend the row by adding a very large number in front of it and a very large number after it. And then I keep my own index here. Some languages have an index mapping that will actually keep track of the index as you map across the list. Um, Lisp does not have that, at least not in the core language. So um, I had to create the index myself. And to be honest, I'm not using, I'm incrementing it here, which I really shouldn't do in functional programming. But um, again, this was, as I said, this was something I didn't try to think, to think about too much. Then I used the same trick that we saw in the first talk where I take the row and the CDR row and CDDR row so that we can step across three elements at a time. So the first call will see the first element, second and third. The second call will see two, three, and four. The next call will see three, four, and five, and so on, so on until the shorter of the list runs out, which is obviously this one because we have chopped two elements off it. And for each of those triples of elements, it calls the function saying, if we have got this, then return that. Prog one says, just focus on this return value. And then it calls this incremental thing for as a side effect. Now this thing says, if this statement is true, then return the list of the index. And if not return nil. And now we get to our sep second mapping function, which is mapcan. Mapcan works exactly like mapcar, except it expects the lambda, the function that it applies to return a list at all times and the lists are end conked together. So where mapcar just returns a function value and creates a list of those function values, mapcan takes the list of values and splices the lists together. And the effect of that is that I can have the function return, in this case, one element or zero elements. So this thing, if this statement is true, I want it to return an element, the index that I'm gathering up in my list. And if not, I want it to return nil, which is the empty list, which when I splice them together, will just mean that there's nothing there. There's an absent element. Now, if you find this confusing, we'll see more examples of this in a moment. So, so just have patience, but um, it's a way of, and, and to be sure I could have done this in other ways as well but it's a way of, of using the mapping functions to create a list where the function that I map across my input lists returns a variable number of arguments. So let's look at that again in a different example, which I will also return to later. Um, so this is FizzBuzz, which you've probably heard about. The, it's, it's, it's a sort of programming puzzle where you return, if a number is divisible by three, you return fizz. If the number is divisible by five, you, you return buzz. And if it's, return, if it's divisible by both three and five, you return fizz buzz. And if not, you just return the number itself. So we're playing with this a little bit. Um, so here's my first example of fizz. Uh, so buzz just returns the, either the, a list of buzz or the empty list, depending on whether the number is divisible by five or not. Fizz, on the other hand, in this implementation calls 
buzz as well. And then it adds to that by calling a function that either adds the, the, the symbol fizz to it or does nothing to the value that buzz returns. So you can see if I call fizz on two, it, re it returns nil because it's neither fizz nor buzz. If I call fizz on six, it returns the list of fizz. If I recall fizz on 10, it returns the list of buzz. And fizz on 30 returns fizz and buzz. OK, so this is just part of our building helper functions to solve fizz buzz. Here's a bit of meditation um, whether this thing would work. So here I have, I decide whether this value is true to either call this function or this function on whatever buzz returned. And that may seem a little bit convoluted and, and probably it is, right? I just wanted to illustrate a kind of functional programming where, where you can call a function that is itself returned by another function. And here, in fact, are the alternatives, which are probably cleaner. Um, so if you want to maintain the code, then this is probably the better way of doing it. So either you call buzz first and you say, either add fizz to it or just return whatever buzz returned directly. Or you could have the value where we don't use this, this binding temporary variable and you could just have the, a bit of code duplication. But we only call one of the branches anyway, so, so we don't actually call buzz more than once. So, you know, it's a, a matter of taste a little bit. Okay, so that was just a sort of different examples. Um, so in FizzBuzz, you need to take numbers from one up to some number n, and then you run FizzBuzz on all those numbers. So we need to generate a list of numbers. So here's like the factorial we had before, where um, it kind of works the same way, except we're not multiplying the numbers we're just creating a list of those numbers. So it starts with a, a wrapper function and then it has a helper function inside it where labels lets me call the helper function recursively. So it says, um, if I have reached one, then stop. If not, then take, uh, create a list, const k1 with whatever the iota is of the other numbers and then I have to reverse them at the end. And end reverse, you will recall, is the one with the side effect that it actually destroys the list, but because it's a temporary list, then it's okay. So that's why it's safe to use end reverse. Now we'll get back to the naming here as well, because you might say, uh, well, actually this is not a good way of naming things because K1 is a little bit confusing when I call this one K. And to be sure, there are many times when I have mistyped things in here and typed K instead of K1 and, and the program hasn't worked. So you might say that we'll return to naming again today as well, if we have time. So anyway, we want to get back to MapCan. So initially, I'm just using it to, to illustrate that the FIS function can now return zero, one, or two values. And if all I wanted to do was to collect those values, then I can do that with MapCan because the fizz function returns a list of its values. So there's zero, one, or two. And MapCan just calls it fizz on my list of integers. And then it splices all the returned lists together. And it splices them with NCOG. So it is a destructive splicing. Now, we, we're doing this because we like to do mappings because we, we want to illustrate using mappings in functional programming. But if you were actually just trying to solve a problem where you had zero or one value, then it would be cleaner to use delete or delete if. Um, and we will see examples of that later as well. So, um, so for zero or one, it may be cleaner to use that like I, like, like I did before why I used MapCan. It might be cleaner just to have said remove if uh, something other, but um, uh, as, I said, as I said, we will return to that later as well. So since we're here, we might as well just finish solving FizzBuzz. So um, we write another function called FizzBuzz number, which calls Fizz. Now this one says if the number has, if the list that is returned by Fizz has two elements, then return the symbol fizzbuzz because I know those two elements would be fizz and buzz. 
And if not, then just take the first element. And this, I think, is one of the examples where, where Lisp is actually beautiful because this, first of all, this thing will, will say, I don't have to count the list of the number of elements in the list and saying, do you have two elements in there? I just have to see, say, is there a second element in the list? And I do that by checking that the CDR is not nil. And secondly, this car that extracts the first element will not complain if the list is empty. It will just return nil. So many a language, when you have sort of give me the first element of the list, if the list is empty, they will raise an exception or some other counterproductive thing. And Lisp here doesn't do that. It will just say, well, you know, if it's an empty list, then probably you want it nil anyway. And it works perfectly here. It is actually, actually exactly what we need. And the rest is straightforward. We use Mapcar as before and um, IOTA, because now this, this function is returning a symbol rather than a list. And then we use IOTA as before and the, pro and the program generates the expected output here. So the final piece of thing to note is if you look at this, Mapcar creates a list which is based on IOTA. And if you're interested in efficiency, you might argue that IOTA creates a list of numbers from one to something to K, which we then throw away. Because once Mapcar has finished running, we throw the IOTA list away and return, because Mapcar creates a fresh list of the values that it, it encounters as we go along. So if you're interested in efficiency, that's not a good thing because you will have this memory that, that gets allocated and then not used except as a temporary thing. So in common Lisp, we can actually use, I can create my IOTA list and then use the map into function into this list. And then my Lambda as before that calls the function. And then the parameter that I use as input. So map into works on sequences that tells me that I want to reuse the IOTA list. So I create the IOTA list the list of numbers from one to K and it's called, it's called M. I then map over it, but the results of that map go into the same list M. And that means that there's no waste. Um, so at the expense of writing a little more code and, and perhaps it's less clean to read, but if efficiency is a, uh, an issue, then it just means that I reuse the same const cells that IOTA created for me because I don't need those again. I just need to, to have the list of, of FizzBuzz. Okay, so that finished FizzBuzz and we'll go on to look at other mapping functions. So, uh, yes. <laughs> when you say the first one, the FizzBuzz number was doing a symbol rather than a list. What does that mean? It's just a single number when you mean a symbol. Or a single value, is that what you mean by a symbol? Uh, yeah, so IOTA creates a list of values and numbers from one to K. And and this call replaces it with whatever the FizzBuzz is of that. So some no, of those- in the, in the previous one, sorry, in the uh, FizzBuzz, in the second function, I think in the first one, the FizzBuzz number, you say it returns a symbol. What, what, what does it? It's like returns a symbol. It returns oh, only the word piece or bus. Is that what uh, it yeah? So that's a good question. So so this one will see a list of fizz and buzz, and if it does so, it will just create the symbol fizz bus and return that. Okay, so value. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I was not clear about the symbol where the symbol has another meaning. It's just the a word or a number or a single thing. It's not a group of them. Yeah. So okay. so in 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 Lisp. Um, we return lists, um, like in the last one, right? That's the first written in a list. All, all of these things are symbols. And some of these symbols name functions, and some of them are just symbols that I introduce as part of my code. So this is instead of using strings, if if I had returned strings from FizzBuzz, I could just have concatenated the strings and that would be fine. But because I'm lazy, I use symbols instead of strings, which just makes it easier. But it just means that Concatenating symbols is possible, but it's much harder than concatenating strings. 
So I'm just lazy here and saying, um, if I see fizz and buzz together, then I will create a new symbol fizz buzz and return that. Okay, then, all right, okay. So, okay yeah. that, 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 that explains my misunderstanding of many things. Okay, that symbol, it doesn't mean a string. Symbol it means a letter, which is not even a string. It's, it's a, as you say, a variable or, some, or something, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so, so <laughs> it's a good question. So symbol doesn't mean a single thing. It, it's, it's, um, it's Lisp speak for something that can reference something. So CDR is a symbol that references a function. But this was is a symbol that reference what? Yeah, so one is not a symbol because one is an integer. Okay. But X is a symbol. And X in this case is um, doesn't exist except as a symbol. It's not bound to anything. But when the function is called, then X will be bound to whatever the parameter, uh, whatever the argument is passed to the, to the function. And Fizzbus is also a symbol, like in the in the function about when you return Fizzbus, that's also a symbol, but it doesn't refer to nothing. It's just it's like it, exactly. It refers to nothing. So the quote here says to not evaluate the symbol. It just says um, just return the the symbol without trying to look it up as a variable or as a function or as anything else. Just return the symbol as a as a symbol. Because otherwise we'll try to find it and say, oh, that doesn't refer to anything and fails, right? Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't reference anything. It's just there as a symbol. Um, so this this goes back to the origins of of Lisp, where um, they use symbols to, for example, do AI programming and stuff. So that it was all sort of symbolic. Um, so fizz is a separate symbol, and buzz is a separate symbol, and fizzbuzz is a symbol. They're all different symbols, and um, and they have no value. They have no, you can't look them up as variables because they're not bound to anything. They, you can't look them up as functions because, well, actually they are bound as functions, but that's sort of a, what I did over here. Um, so I bind the symbol fizz to the function that takes a number and returns some stuff. Um, but they don't have to be bound. I'm actually abusing them a little bit by having the, using both the, the symbols as return values and as names of the functions. So I can see that may be a little bit confusing. Okay. Um, so the other case where you use, use Mapcar, if you're interested in efficiency, you probably want to say, um, suppose we're calling things that, that shows an, an exception when we find the thing we're looking for. And I want to call that across a list. So I have some, some data, and which is itself a list, and I want to call a goal function on it to return true when I find the goal. And when it finds it, then I want it to, to throw in, um, uh, what you might call an exception, which is caught by some outer loop of, of this. So if it doesn't find anything, however, it will return just a list of nil, 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 because that's not interesting. It, it, all it says is the first element is not a goal, the second element is not a goal, and so on. So if you're just interested in the side effect, you can use the map function and tell it to return nil anyway, and then it just doesn't bother calculating the, the results. So here's the same thing before, um, examine a state from the list, from data, and saying when you find a goal, then throw the, the um, exception, the non-local return but don't bother calculating whatever the result is because we're not interested in the, in the actual result because it'll just be a list of nils. So the map function is a sort of generalization in a way of map car because it will let me create a list of something. It will also let me create a vector of them and a string. So what it has, what they have in common is that they're sequences. So I can take one sequence and I can map a function across those sequences and I can create a, the same kind of sequence or a different kind of sequence if I wanted to. So for example, this is um, Emacs notation for a vector of one, two, three, four. And I call the function that adds two to the number and, and say return a list. So it creates a list of numbers. Then I can take the same list and a function that subtracts two and say return a vector and it gives me back that vector. Or I can say, give me a string, add 32 to the number. This thing is an, an Emacs specific thing uh, because 
characters in Emacs are integers, so I can actually just add a number to them. So the character code for A in ASCII is uh, 65. And if I add 32 for that, I get the character code for lowercase a. So the effect of that is to essentially map integers to integers. But because I asked Emacs to format them as strings, I actually get strings out of it with characters in them. So if all you wanted to do is to conversion, then you could use the coerce function because it just tells me tells Lisp to create to take the list and then create a vector out of it. But if you also wanted to do the mapping and you wanted to return a special kind of sequence, then you can use the map function. And as we've seen, a special case is also just returning nil if you're calling the sequence for side effect only for when the function has a side effect which obviously it doesn't have here. It, it just returns the, the value. Okay. So um, suppose we didn't have Mapcar in Emacs. We could have written it ourselves. And this is probably how you might write it in the first attempt. So you, it takes a function and it takes a list. In Emacs, the Mapcar only takes a single list argument, whereas in common Lisp, it will accept multiple lists, but um, let's leave that for later. So you say, um, like we've seen in the first talk, um, okay, if the list is empty, then just return an empty list. That's the easy case. And then the harder case is to call the function on the first element of the list. And then we call the, the ourselves recursively on the rest of the list, and then we const those things together. And you can see that works very well. Uh, we have the number 16, four, blah, blah, blah. And we call the square root function on that and it gives us this, this result. So this is essentially what, what Mapcar, how Mapcar is written. And, um, and it's kind of a common pattern. Um, obviously it's a very simple pattern. In this case, we would probably have used Mapcar as defined in, in the CL package. But um, what I want you to focus on is the pattern that um, we do uh, uh, the simple case where there's nothing left to do, like we saw with the factorial. And then we do the, the cons of doing something with the first element. And then we do whatever we would do recursively on the rest of the list. Because with this in mind, I want to return to one of the exercises that we had in the first talk. And uh, actually the harder one of the two exercises we had in the first talk. So the, the goal was to sum a window of three elements. So we wanted to look at the three elements at a time, summing one, five, and four together, which gives us 10. Then we sum four, five, and one together, which also gives us 10. We sum four, one, and three together, which gives us eight. And so on until we get to three, six, two, which sums to um, 11, I think. So. In talk one, the windows that we summed were always of size three. And the exercise in talk one was, what if the window size that we summed was variable? And this is the exercise we're going to look at now. So you can think of this as a kind of test case of what, what, how we want the function to behave, like test-driven programming. If the window size is two and I call it on the same list, then it returns one, uh, one more element. Uh, so one and five together are six, five and four together are nine, four and one are five and so on. And if I ask for a sum of more elements that I've got in my list, then it should just return nil because it's not possible. It becomes an empty list as a special case. So this is the thing we will now solve using mapping. So let's start by writing a helper function, which takes a list and it takes the number of elements we want to solve in, uh, we want to sum in the list. So some helper four will take the first four elements of the list and ignore the rest. Some helper one will take the first element of the list and ignore the rest. Some helper zero will take the first zero elements of the list and return the sum of those. And as you know, the, if you sum zero elements, you get zero. You can actually do this in Emacs if you just put plus in a parenthesis. 
it will give you zero because it's the identity when you sum nothing. And if I do some helper of five elements and there are only four elements in the list, it should return nil. So this is our helper function. This is where we start. So we sort of start from the bottom up. And the example is interesting because we have two ways of stopping. We either stop because we have finished summing four elements or one element or whatever, or we stop because we have run out of elements. So here's how, how I solve that one. So we saw in talk one how we split things up into using cont in general. Uh, so we have n, we have the data as before. So if n has hit zero, then we'd return zero. If we run out of data, then we return nil. And then we get to the complicated stuff. So in this case, we create a value. Well, we create a, um, a result thing, which is the value of the recursion, essentially. So the in the recursive case, we subtract one from n, and we subtract an element from the data. And we store that, whatever comes back, we store that in result. So this may now be an integer, or it may be nil. If we go to this branch, if we stop at this branch, it will be an integer. If we stop at this branch, it will return nil. And then we say, if we have a result, that is, it is not nil, then add the first element of data to the result. And what this should remind you of is this thing. It is essentially the same pattern where we add the first element of the data to whatever came out of the recursive call, except that there are now two return values. One of them is an integer and one of them is nil. So I have to test for that in this result. So if result is nil, then re the result of the and is also nil. If result is not nil, then the result is whatever I get by adding the first element to the result. That will be re the result of the and. And in fact, you can paste that into Emacs and you can go back and test it on these cases and you will get exactly what is described here. So this is our helper function. Now I need the function to call the helper function. So to do that, I might start by using the same pattern again. So let's call the function sum window and it calls a K on, on whatever the data is. And again, we use recursion because we, we're functional programmers. So I call the sum helper on, on the data and then I do the same thing. I call myself recursively on, on CDR data, so with the first element removed. And you can see when we call that, it actually works really well because I get the numbers 10, 10, 10, 10, blah, 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 except I get nil at the end. And I get nil at the end, obviously, because it is some window is still being called, but it has run out of elements now. It, by the time it reaches the, the last few elements, it cannot do a sum of three elements anymore because there are not three elements left in the call. So again, this should remind you of this pattern where we do something on the first element and we do something on the second on the rest of the list recursively, except that I'm not using the first element anymore because some helper needs to see the list that we're working on. Because some helper needs to see the whole list and then it needs to see the whole list and the whole list and the whole list as we walk through the list because it needs to sum elements of the list. It doesn't, it's not enough for some helper to see the first element of the list. It must see them in sequence as we walk through the list. So it is now seeing the whole data list rather than just the first element of the list, but otherwise the pattern is the same. So you can see it works very well, except for giving us those nils at the end. So um, we're kind of almost there. 
So what we can do is uh, there is actually another function, another mapping function called maplist, which will do precisely this, which will implement the pattern that we have just looked at. Now it will still give us, give us nils at the end, but let's worry about those in the next slide. Um, what we uh, so initially we just focus on this pattern. So this is exactly like the map card pattern, except we are looking at the whole list rather than just looking at the single element of the list. So if I call map list with identity, you, we, you can see how it works. It takes the list one, two, three, four, five, then it takes the list two, three, four, five, three, four, five, four, five, and five. And it calls the, in this case, the identity function on them. And then it creates a list of the results. And this is exactly what we need to implement this pattern. So if you saw before why I implemented a map car, here I have implemented a function which is essentially map list. So I don't have to do that because Lisp has a map list inside that I can use instead, which is a much more concise way of expressing the same pattern that I'm looking for. So you may want to ponder as you look through the slides later, what this actually means. It means that, so these lists are actually the same const cells that we're looking at. We're stepping through the same list. The identity function doesn't make any copies or anything. It just looks at the list as we step through it. So this const cell that starts the two is the same const cell that you see in here. This list is the same as this list. And likewise, this list of four five is the same as this four five sublist, which is the same as this one and the same as this one, which is important if you actually need to do something like mess around with the list or something. But here we're just being nice functional programmers. We're just um, generating values out of the list. Okay, let's look at the nils and get rid of them. So the simple way of getting rid of them is just to delete them at the end. So we say, yeah, okay, I call map list. It's nice and concise, but it'll generate nils at the end. So uh, let me just get rid of them. Or we can go back to the mapcan stuff. If you remember mapcan, I can use that where the functions return a variable number of elements in a list. Now mapcar calls a function across a list and mapcan does the same thing, except it accepts that it expects that function to return a list of elements. There is a similar version to maplist that expects the function that it calls to return a list and it con concatenates those lists together and it's called mapcon. And if we do that, uh, the function will look like this. And again, it's pretty concise still, but I need to make sure that my sum helper now returns a list rather than a value because mapcon will enconc those lists together. So it, ex it needs the function to return a list. So what's happening is the same data is put in as before. We call the function uh, some sort of wrapper function now for the sum helper which works exactly as before. So it either, either returns an integer or it returns nil. And what we're saying is we, if it returns an integer, then we want it. And if it returns nil, then we don't want it. So if it returns an integer, then this and would be true. And I create a list of V, which would just give me a list of that integer. If V is nil, then the result of the and is also nil, which is the empty list. And eventually mapcon gets around to enconking all those lists together. And you will see precisely this where the nil values are not in there because it still concatenates the empty lists, but the result of that is just that they, you know, you can't see them. So it's actually a very elegant way of doing things where uh, you need some results to not appear in, the, res in the, the final list that we're putting together. So it's not very often that I use MapCon to be sure, but it's nice to know it's there because it's actually 
sometimes is just exactly the right thing. So once you recognize the patterns, you can apply these mapping functions. So we're nearly done with mapping functions and, and we're actually we're probably nearly running out of time as well. Um, so one more, more thing you might want to think about is when you map for side effect. So we saw that before in the goal function when, when I returned, when I threw an exception or something. Here, um, suppose we want to change a list. So we have a list of one, two, three, four, and I want to change all of those elements to threes. And naively, I write map car lambda x set x to three, and I call it on this particular list. And indeed, it does return three, 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 three. But it doesn't do what I expected because the original list, if I actually see, if I ask Lisp what was the original Lisp, it has not changed at all. So you may want to think, why am I seeing 333 here if I'm not changing this list? And you may also want to ponder why I'm using list here rather than the, the single quote, um, to, um, which is a, a reader macro say, don't, don't evaluate this. OK. So what I could do is use map list. Because if you remember, map list sees a sequence as it walks through the list. So now it doesn't see the elements of the list. It sees the list itself, which means I can change the first element of the list. So that's precisely what I do here. I ask it to increment the element of the list rather than put a three in there, but I could ask it, I could just as well have asked it to put a three in, in place of, of, the, of the list. And indeed, it has changed it. So when I, when I look at my list here, it, it has changed it. So this is a little bit of a dirty trick in a way, because probably you don't want to use map list for this as a clean programming technique, but actually it does work. If you actually needed that, it would work. So map list itself also creates a temporary list that um, um, it also returns. And that list is in fact a different list from this list. So this list is the original list that was modified. And this list is what map list returns because map list creates its own list of results that it gets out of calling these. Map list itself doesn't care that the, that the function has a side effect. It just takes whatever it got out of those results. It just implements the pattern that we looked at before and takes the results and puts them together in a list. So this takes us to the end of the mapping functions. And since we've almost run out of time, it's probably useful to stop there and then do the rest another day. So this is a, um, much more about mapping functions that you're normally likely to see, but I wanted to show you how the functional programming patterns that you're likely to implement translates into mapping functions in Lisp. And hopefully you will get an impression also that the mapping functions in Lisp are much more powerful than the kind of stuff you get in Perl or Python or other languages like that. You, you have much more powerful functions that can do things that um, may shock a functional programmer, but um, are actually very useful sometimes. Thank you, Jens. Uh, questions? Very good button. Hey, where are all um, What happened when you were throwing an exception? Does it the map keeps going to all the values or it stops on the, when the first one is found? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it stops when. So if, if the function has side effects, you can rely on it being applied in list order. So it will evaluate up to the point where the exception is thrown. And then it raises the exception, which is then, if it's not caught, you will get an error. But um, if it is caught, which it normally, there would be a catch outside it somewhere and it will catch it and then, but you will then have, a, the list would have been called, um, the function would have, called, would have been called on the list right up to the point where the, the exception is thrown. 
Okay, and in the same example that you were showing with the second, the function that you were running, the go, 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 go something, what does it say do? Uh, which function? Sorry. The, the, in the example that you were showing the, showing the second, it wasn't, it, you were running a function on it. So I don't, I, I didn't recognize what the function was. Yeah. Uh, go, go, something. I don't know whether that was a made up function or that was a real something in this. Okay, um, I, I don't know, I'll probably have to find yeah. it. So anyway, I will make oh, the slides yeah, yeah. available and we can, whoops. It, it was uh, after that, go, D-O-L-T, next. This one? That, I think. No. When the exception was shown. Oh, the same like that. this one, gold, yeah. Gold state. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so uh, because the function here has a side effect, if if you like, of, of, of a non-local return, then it will, you can rely on it being called on the data list in order. And, um, but only up till this, this thing has been thrown and then uh, whatever is less left in the data list will not um, it will not call that because it will in fact the, the map car function will never return okay. so this this is one of the advanced topics that we'll also cover when we get to that in there okay. um, so I, I have a list of like somewhere 13 or 16 or something advanced topics to cover and one of them is <laughs> is non-local return because it's one of the things that um, you can often do in functional programming as well as other programs of course and and uh, pure functional programmers want to model that with a monad so we'll get we'll get to monad somewhere near the end so goal means anything this P-O-A-L-P, is that a function or something or what? Uh, yeah, the, it, it is a function, but you, but I haven't defined it here. So it, it, the, the code presumes that I have defined that somewhere. Oh, okay, so it's, it's, okay. it's not something like a map or a car or something like it was. It's, it's a, no, it, the, there's it's no built-in, okay. yeah, exactly. So there's no built-in function called goal P. There's, there's just, um, I'm just using the naming pattern of many of the, of the Lisp functions have a P at the end when they're predicates. Yeah. So um, I'm just saying, is this state a goal or not? And if it is, then then I will go, yes, I found it. Uh, so it assumes that there is a, a catch around it that, that looks for this tag and will then return the value of state. So, that, so it's kind of a, when you solve puzzles and things like um, you do in, in Lisp, then you sometimes get very deep inside a nested set of functions and, and, and loops and stuff. And and you don't really want to unwind when you find the goal because you just you want just want it to go back to the beginning and say, look, I found it. Rather than having to to return, 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 and then get it back up to where you started. So sometimes it's it's just the easiest way to get something back out of the uh, of the call stack, just to, to do a non-local return. But as for a different day. <laughs> Indeed, we'll do that okay. a different day. Yes. Okay, because I, I, I'm already lost there. What yeah. other questions do you people have? Uh, Eric, if you're talking about we don't hear you. I mean, we can try to read your lips, but it's really hard. We hear you before. Nope. No, at least not me. I don't know. I'm afraid not. No, no, I can't hear you either. I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, la Macarena. All right. So, uh, at least I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Type it on the chat. Okay. Well, I will make the slides available, and next time we have a catch up, we can we can. Um, you know, we can uh, discuss discussing. if you like. Yeah, yeah. because I, I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will have more questions, but I can actually try to yeah. put them in place and try to solve the exercise. So, yeah, I realized I ran through things fairly 
quickly. And if if this is all new stuff to you, then then it's probably a little bit daunting. But um, at least you have the slides and you can read them at your leisure. And we will then. Uh, the main thing I wanted to communicate was that many of the patterns that we use as functional programmers are actually implemented in Lisp's mapping functions, which makes it possible for us to write really concise code and readable code. And there seem to be quite a few mapping functions. I don't know if there are even more that you find useful that you didn't have time to fit in. Yeah, so I actually have covered them all, I think. Uh, there are packages that extend mapping functions a bit, but but these are the ones that are at the core core Lisp. I had originally I hadn't intended to cover them all, but then I realized that were, they were actually part of the same patterns. So map car and map list and um, map can and map con are, are sort of doing the same things. And um, so I, I thought, yeah, okay, I'll put them together because they, they're kind of implementing the same kinds of patterns it, that we often do in, in functional programming when we divide and conquer. Fascinating. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, the whole world now for me. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So thank you very much for staying with me. And I hope you will join me again in the next talk where we will look at some of the practical issues of uh, writing functional code. Like when do you use labels and when do you use helper functions? So if you go back to here, for example, here's a helper function that is a standalone helper. But when I implemented the IOTA, I used labels inside. So we'll look a little bit about that, how, how to do these things. We'll look at some advanced uses of lists. And yeah, that'll be it for the basics section. And then we'll go on to the advanced topics. So I hope you'll join me then. And thank you very much for joining today. <laughs>